could you survive on welfare? It's a question that's divided the nation. The rising cost of living is leaving the unemployed in dire straits. People living on job seeker need a greater level of support. People are unable to cover basic costs of living, such as housing, food, transport, healthcare and utilities. It's easy to get by on welfare. <laughs> You're fucking joking, mate. But increasing welfare would cost taxpayers billions. The best form of welfare is a job, Mr Speaker. We're making it too easy for them to say, I don't need to work. I've seen grandfathers, fathers and sons all on unemployment benefits. Why? Australia spends over $180 billion a year on welfare. I'm on the disability pension. Job seeker payment. More than the health, education and defence budgets combined. I get $700 a fortnight. But is that enough? All politicians sometimes need to step out of the office. They think living on the dole's easy. They've never been on welfare. They need to come down onto my level and see what it's like to live like this. Three prominent Australians are going on a journey into Australia's welfare system. New South Wales Greens MP Jenny Leong believes we should be doing more for the disadvantaged. We need to be demanding that this government takes firm action to ensure no one is too poor to be able to live. But does she, or her political colleagues, really understand what life is like on the breadline. As a member of parliament, you are so privileged. People that are in ministerial positions, that have drivers, that have staff, and then those people, they reckon they could get by on the welfare that is basically putting people in poverty. There's no way. Caleb Bond is a Sky News commentator and News Corp journalist. What the hell is toxic masculinity? I mean, what about toxic femininity? When are we going to start talking about that? He's compared welfare recipients to heroin users. The welfare system, it's not meant to be an income. It's not meant to be necessarily comfortable. Julie Goodwin is an author, TV presenter, radio host and household name. You are Australia's first master chef. The reason I'm going on this journey is I certainly know what it's like to not have money in the bank. There's always been a stigma surrounding collecting unemployment. I had to do that when I was younger and I felt the stigma of having to do that. I would hope that our views of it are changing, but I'm not so sure they are. For nine days, all three are going to live on the welfare system. If cash is this tight, I'm pretty much happy to do anything. Oh, I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel slightly uncomfortable. They'll be meeting and living with fellow Australians who know what life is really like on welfare. This is how we have to live. Going to We're the surviving. For fuck's sake, isn't that what the government's supposed to do in the first place? There must be a bit of DV in the next um, block. The further I go along this journey, the more traumatic and devastating things become. Like, I've done everything that I can. I, I think it's criminal that the welfare that they're on is not enough for them to eat with. <sighs> Do people deserve more? A lot of people probably don't understand what it's like. Or have millions of Australians simply become reliant on the welfare system? Twenty-one-year-old Caleb Bond started work as a cadet journalist at the age of 16 in his home city of Adelaide. People from Adelaide are very fun. You know, Alexander Downer and, and people like this. People compare me to Christopher Pine all the time. I get along with Christopher quite well. He's a very fun bloke. For the next three days, Caleb will be trying to get by with people on various forms of welfare. I don't believe in a welfare system that would replace a job. It's there as a safety net, and it should be there as a safety net. Caleb's meeting Pierre, who lives on the disability support pension. The DSP supports almost 4% of the Australian population who are unable to work due to a permanent medical condition. How are you, mate? Good, nice to meet you, Pierre. Pleased to meet you, nice Caleb. Nice to meet you. And what's uh, your bird's name? This is Caesar. Caesar? <laughs> How long you had him? Um, 12 and a half years. He's got 52 to go. Jesus. 
So you probably outlive me. And if you don't look good. after yourself, he may outlive you as well. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. 59 year old Pierre has lived on the DSP for over 20 years. So my little treat in life is a, a coffee and a cigarette every morning. And that makes me feel like a normal citizen, believe it or not. Gets me out the house. Now, can I buy you a coffee? Yes, that'd be great. Pierre receives a payment of $840 a fortnight. This needs to cover rent, electricity, food, and medical bills. Pierre's order. Yep. Um, and, uh, One of the things that uh, I would say annoys me is when you see people who are on welfare who might spend their money on uh, alcohol or cigarettes. So this is your one ciggy for the day, is it? Yeah, in fact, I have to make a decision. I'll see how much, um, I've got to go to get some food today. But I was hoping you could squeeze another packet of cigarettes in before pension day. So I've just got a, some tight budget at the yeah. moment. And I've got to buy these guys some food because they're nearly out. And that's something I've got to keep in mind, Caesar. What's your illness? Irritable bowel syndrome. So what, what do you deal with day to day? I can uh, maybe not hold food down, it's not vomit. When it gets really bad and I have an attack, I'll vomit for days on end. Really? Wind up in hospital because I wind up dehydrating and on a drip. Out of Pierre's pension, he pays 25% for his social housing flat, leaving him $45 a day to live on. For the next two days, Caleb will experience what Pierre's life on welfare is really like. Welcome to the, the abode. You'll have to excuse me, I haven't done the normal clean up with the parrots this morning. Pierre rescues injured and sick birds. Okay. He pays for their rehabilitation out of his own pension. This is a monkey. Right. Monkey fell out of his nest about six years ago. That's Joan of Arc. And that's Winston Churchill. <laughs> Hello, Winston. He dislocated his leg and oh, broken yeah. it. So I took him down to my local vet, and $2,000 later, big operation, he's in a cast for months. Um, so I've got a $2,000 bill for a bird I don't even own and I'm paying off at the moment. Where do you get $2,000? I don't, I just have him to, he's, he's generous enough to run the bill up for me and right. allow me three or four years to pay it off. I mean, I just paid 200 bucks off that last week because I got a bit behind. <laughs> I had the money there, but it means I've got no money till Thursday. You find yourself having to put I'm the birds head. ahead of yourself? Oh, time. definitely. Like, if, if, it's a, if it gets to a choice of I go without food or they go without food, it's, I can tell you which one goes. Pierre suffers from a chronic form of irritable bowel syndrome that's highly debilitating. Could you find a job? Um, not really, with the illness. I'm not, not, not sure I'd be capable of doing it. So what, what is your IBS like now? Well, this morning I got up and threw up all the bile off my stomach. Um, I mean, it seems to have settled down now. Um, How often would that happen? Uh, at least three or four times a week. Did you ever... Um, think when you were younger that you might be able to go back to work? It didn't really dawn on me. And that's the other thing too, is that, you know, it took me years to admit that I had a disability. How much income would you have to earn to have your benefits cut off? I think you're allowed to earn 136 a week. So you would be worse off if you were working? Well, way worse off, yeah. You've got to make the most of what you've got, really, let's face it. It's nice of Pierre to let me into his life and let me sleep in his house. This one was rescued about six months ago, flew into a window. Pierre scrapes by on the DSP. But to be perfectly honest, I don't know whether I'm going to change my mind. Greens member for Newtown, Jenny Leong, is travelling to Wollongong to see what it's like living on welfare in regional Australia. I grew up in Adelaide in what was probably a very standard, middle-class, comfortable life. When I was a student, I was on Ostudy, but I was always in a situation where my parents were relatively comfortable. I knew that if something big happened in my life, I could have the benefit of ringing my parents and asking to borrow money. She'll be moving in with 41-year-old Shanine. Hi, Jenny. Hello. 
Was it a good trip? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jenny. I'm Janine. Janine yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice so to meet good you. to meet you. Yeah, How you, you too. Yeah, good. Thank you for meeting me. Shanine lives on the job seeker allowance. 25% of her payment goes on renting a two bedroom flat through social housing, which leaves her with $30 a day. So how long have you been in Wollongong for? Um, I grew up in Wollongong. Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. yeah. But Amazing. I moved away for a while to Queensland. Jenny will be staying in Shanine's spare room for free. I've been living here, like in this unit block for six months. There's quite a lot of crime. Yeah. Um, drugs is just rife. Ten minutes' drive from the Wollongong CBD is the estate Shanine lives in. You'll notice that there's, it's quite camera up. There was an elderly gentleman that got um, killed, so everyone was standing over him for yeah. his pay and stuff. And eventually they took him up to the service station at the top of the street, got his pension out, and then they killed him and left him in, they left him in this um, oh. laundry block here. He was there for a few days. People were stepping over him to do their laundry. So yeah, I usually have to lock my screen door, because yeah. as you can see, my, kick, my door's been yeah, kicked in quite right. a few times. Yeah. Do you keep shoes on? Yeah. Her. Shanine studied social work and for many years worked for the council in Aboriginal community development. But for the past three years, Shanine relied on Newstart, now called the Job Seeker Allowance. I was in a relationship and, um, yeah, he severely beat me. So, um, yeah, like I, I had, I got now got a quiet brain injury um, from the beating and I was strangled. Her injuries were so severe, she was forced to quit her job. Yeah, I had to do physio, I had to learn how to walk and talk again. Two years ago, I couldn't do the pincher and pointer. That's what that, I was going to say, that's the test, right? Yeah, I was on life support and stuff, so I had no, yeah, I had to sort of start all over again. So how does it feel, like, for you living here by yourself? Um, yeah, unsafe, very unsafe. If there's a neighbour, DV, and his, his partner, I get anxious because I can hear it all. After an earlier incident of domestic violence, Shanine was left unable to care for her children. My two main priorities, yeah. try and get my kids back yeah. in my care, but also to try and better my housing situation. Yeah. Shanine works to a strict budget. Yeah, I get 550 a fortnight, I'd say 150 towards rego. Um, around about $100 for fuel, probably, I think, $20 extra for electricity. Yeah. And, yeah, about $100 on smokes, yeah. which will leave me with 80 bucks. And, yeah, the 80 bucks that I get, yeah. it would be pretty much used on the kids to yeah. go on a visit. If I don't stick to my budget, and I get, live with nothing for two weeks yeah, right. until I get paid again, yeah. which I did last fortnight. Yeah. Like, I literally yeah. lived on nothing for two weeks. Seriously, look, I can't even... I can't even comprehend that, like it's just too intense. Yeah. yeah. It's intense. For Jenny's first night, Shanine wants to make a special meal. Chicken, chips and salad? Yeah, let's yeah. do that. OK, cool. On her welfare budget, it's a rare treat. I feel, I guess, pretty overwhelmed. It's been one day, it, has, it hasn't been a, a long time. I think the, the thing that I would say is probably the hardest habit to break so far has been the fact that um, I don't know what's coming. Julie Goodwin is heading to Campbelltown in southwest Sydney. She's going to see firsthand how hard it is to survive on the job seeker allowance of $40 a day. I am not convinced that I'll survive very well on $40 a day. On its own sounds OK, but then you've got rent and you've got, I don't know, petrol or public transport. You've got to feed yourself. And that leaves nothing. Like most residents of Western Sydney, you need a car. So Julie's been given a second-hand vehicle to get around. I'm driving around on toll roads. If I was surviving on $40 a day, I don't know how I'd get by. The number of people on JobSeeker in Campbelltown is almost 50% higher than the national average. Some people are born with, you know, massive wealth behind them. Some people are born with huge amounts of support behind them. And some are born without that. 
People who are raised in really difficult circumstances don't have the same chances as other people to, to get ahead in life. Julie's new home is in crisis accommodation supplied for free by the Department of Housing. As a 50-year-old woman, Julie falls into the highest demographic facing homelessness in Australia. It's got a locking door, it's got a bathroom. That's about it. It's a very cute little bath. You have to choose which end of you you want to get wet. Well, it's a little microwave. At least I can heat things up, but um, not a whole lot of gourmet cookery going to be happening in here, I don't think. A few, few sirens outside the door uh, going by. Um, gosh, it's really pretty bleak. <laughs> I guess if you're in a situation where you've got to flee the home you're in or you're unsafe, that come to somewhere like this, I think it would be... I think it would be really hard. I think probably my first mission is going to be to find out where there's a, a supermarket or something nearby where I can go and stock up on a few supplies. When I start to think of all the bits and bobs that I might need, I don't know how far this $40 is really going to go. On the lookout for a shopping centre, and straight away, money is on Julie's mind. I had my eyes open before I drove in here to make sure that it wasn't a a paid parking station as well. I've got a couple of little tins of tuna, a packet of rice, I've got some broccolini and a piece of corn. Um, I've got some butter to go with bread and I've got tea bags, sugar and milk. I've spent just on $27, leaving me 13. I still don't have a plate to eat off or a fork. I'm just going to go to the, the Salvo store that I spotted. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, thank Good. you. The plate was 50 cents and she threw the other things in for free. So that's a bargain. So I've been given the equivalent of the job seek payment. I went out to the supermarket and I felt I shopped quite frugally. Um, I bought the cheap brand of almost everything and I still only have $12 left. Half of the broccolini tonight. It's very simplistic to say, well, anyone can eat on $40 a day. You can, but it's about more than just eating. This is, it's about surviving and whether or not you've got an opportunity to thrive. There is an incredible privilege that I have as, as a very lucky individual that gets a significant wage as being a member of parliament. That means that I don't have to think about money all the time. If I want to buy something, I buy it. New South Wales Greens MP Jenny Leong is finding out firsthand about life on welfare with 41-year-old Shanine. Like how often would it be that you would eat a meal that would be like meat and like that um, you kind of fresh salad and everything like that, oh, rather than baked beans and stuff. Probably once a fortnight. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to my payday, I'll usually pull all my pay out. Yeah. So that I can penny count. And like, I smoke cigarettes, so therefore it's like, you know what I mean? I, sometimes I have to think, ah, oh, do I want a ciggies or do I want some meat this week? Yeah. Having to compromise on what to buy. Yum, it smells lovely. Wasn't always an issue for Shanine. Dropping from that big work wage to Centrelink benefits yeah. was probably the hardest thing for me because yeah. I was so self-sufficient. Thank you. <laughs> no, no worries. Like many women in Shanine's situation, oh, she has no choice but to accept social housing. What you've just described in terms of like, you know, the planning and the shopping and the cooking and, the, and doing all of that, it's like, it is way more of a load than anyone else that is privileged has to do in addition to all the other stress you're having. And if it's not that, then it's the screaming kids and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a lot of them, like I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of them live outside. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Just, just hang of, out. out yeah. There. It's not you that we're looking at. It's all right. <laughs> well, then go. No one's asking you to be here. If you don't live here, don't complain. Fucking how rude. I think nobody needs that shit. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully when, when it gets dark, it'll quieten down a bit, but usually it's party time when it goes to get dark, so. So we might go up to the shop before it gets dark. I was going to say we should do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Shanine um, has run out of cigarettes and I feel like the least I can do um, if I'm staying at her house is to offer to buy a packet of cigarettes. A packet of cigarettes will cost $30, which is Shanine's total daily allowance after rent. People smoke and the idea that you can only smoke if you're rich or you can only drink alcohol if you're rich, I think is just a really problematic concept. A packet of holiday 20s, blue. Some people would say that smoking cigarettes is an essential. Hello, can I get a packet of holiday 20s, please? Thank you. But as someone that used to smoke, I would say that if you are addicted to cigarettes, then the level of stress that it will cause you if you can't have a cigarette is significant. Just the cigarettes. Thank you. Caleb is living with Pierre who for over 20 years has lived on the disability support pension. Come, we're gonna go and get a haircut. <coughs> All right, now behave yourself. The welfare system exists basically to support people who need to be supported. It's not meant to be an income per se. It's not meant to be something that you exist on for a long time. It's not meant to be necessarily comfortable. Hi, Hi. Caleb. Nice yes. Pierre's neighbour Lizzie supplements her own aged pension by offering $5 haircuts to fellow residents. Do you want a haircut, darling? I'm all right today, thank you. 15 odd years you said you've been cutting hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I've been in this department of housing since uh, 85. In this flat? Yep. Yeah. I paid two fifty a fortnight. And you think you'll... Um, Stay here till you. I hope so. I hope they get in the me box. Heaven. Yeah, but I did my hairdressing apprenticeship in the 60s, and then I travelled the world and did a lot of other stuff. I went to Vietnam as a go-go dancer in 1968. Right. And then I went to uh, America and didn't have a green card, so I auditioned at the psychedelic funhouse and became a striptease dancer. <laughs> and I travelled the world. I loved doing that. That was just a wonderful job. I really enjoyed it. There's no money in it. And if you're working on the side or, you know, like, you're a very clever person. What do you think about this, handsome? Are you happy with this? Oh, I'm wrapped. OK, yeah, I'll just do it around the edges. How do you find living on the pension? I'm grateful I get it, but it's a struggle. It's not enough? Um, it's got to be enough, love. You yeah. know, that's what you're surviving on. Yeah. You understand what I mean? Yeah, like, you, know, yeah. you don't get to go to the theatre anymore. Yep. You know, you don't even to the swimming pool. It's eight dollars to yeah, get into the it's swimming just pool. All simple little things. You know, like little, little before, yeah. minor things that people take for granted when going to the pictures. Yeah. yeah, yeah, none of that mm. because you don't have that money. Going to we're the surviving, dinner. you know, and that's yeah. great. You know, I'm we're fairly thankful. grateful. Yeah. What do you reckon, monkey? You look good. You like it? <laughs> But I mean, what did you say? You haven't had a haircut in years, did mm. you say? As you've heard, little, you know, all these little things add up, and you just wind up going without them, and you just. And that's one of them. It's not necessary, you know. So it's not going to kill you if you don't have a haircut. Does it feel like a luxury? Oh, of course it does. And you're really wrapped to have it after. It's something you've been wanting to do for a while, and haven't been able to do. So of course it feels good. Yeah. So how much extra do you think you should be getting a week? Standard, I think, would be sixty-five dollars a day. What what would that extra hundred bucks a week let you do? Three meals on the table. Look, it's not you're not going to be really well off laying in luxury, sipping back um, champagne on a daily basis. It just gives you the three meals, pays your rent, and you might be able to go to the pictures once a month. I think if if Pierre wanted to do better on the money he has, he would have to budget carefully, and I'm not sure Pierre is doing that. For many Australians on welfare, 
Trying to make ends meet can mean making tough choices on what to go without. Unemployed Australians are 23% more likely to experience food insecurity. You, you need to spend money to eat well. You need to exercise to be well. And, and all of those things can be out of reach if you are living on a few dollars a day. In southwestern Sydney, Julie is travelling to meet Uncle Dave to see firsthand how important food drops are in the community. Good morning, Julie. Lovely How'd you sleep? to see you. Very well, thank you. Christian, nice to meet you. Chris. Uncle Chris, yeah. is it? Yeah. Nice to meet you nice too. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Uncle Dave, with help from Uncle Chris and Christian, operates a self-funded charity taking food donations to the less advantaged. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to take you around today to show you the food drop what we do and the pick up and get your get your hands on and you know we do this every every day of the week so yeah okay yes yeah, so every day it's, it's really um, a big journey for us hey Christian you know to make sure that we deliver on the front line to the to the families that are in, haven't got no food make sure they've got food for their kids to put on the table eh? for twelve years Uncle Dave has lived on the job seeker allowance. For over 55s, 15 hours a week voluntary work makes him eligible for the payment. I live on $540 a fortnight. I get $300 taken out on rent, $100 for food and $100 for electricity. So you tell me what's left, $40. At the height of the pandemic, demand for food relief from charities across Australia increased by almost 50%. Oh, wow. Fantastic. That's lots of food. Yeah, that's brilliant. This is amazing on so many different levels. Oh, food that the supermarkets would have discarded, <laughs> would have gone into landfill, is now being collected by the uncles and distributed throughout the community. This is great stuff. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. On average, Indigenous Australians have lower levels of employment and income. A lot of people out here at the moment, they're doing it pretty tough. They feel like they failed, you know, and I'm like, you haven't failed, you haven't got a job. Yeah. And it was out of their control. We've got stacks of nice greens here. I'll distribute some of this to some other families as well. Thank you. No worries. Rightio, next delivery. You get vegetables, you get bread, you get, you know, maybe a couple of bottles of cordial or something. It, it, it all helps. And so you managed to get around and share yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. with everyone, I even... the neighbours up here, this guy over here. Bye, Julie. See ya. The last delivery of the morning is to Uncle Dave's sister, Chandra. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, Chandra, good to meet you. These are all Chandras. All of them? Yeah. Excellent. How would you manage without and these food deliveries? You well, use it. My son is struggling with both from the dollar. Yep. Um, we've got health problems and stuff like that. And I just done three hundred dollar shop yesterday. Yeah. And we broke. You know what well, I mean? And we're struggling and struggling and struggling. So this organisation is a big help to us. A big help. Like yeah, by the time okay. we pay our electricity, our gas, you know, we've got two bills to pay. Yep. And then we've got a food to pay too. We're left with nothing though. Having served prison time, Chandra finds it hard to get a job. So you went to prison when your kids were young? I went to prison in 2016. Yep. I got done for robbery and company from mm -hmm. mobile phone. Yep. I got three and a half years. Um, so that was my first time ever in prison. Oh, wow. Um, so I'd done three, uh, two and a half years straight, yep. with 12 months parole. Yep. Wasn't allowed to home to my family. It killed me. Yeah. You know, I'm getting very emotional. It killed yep. me to walk away from my brother and my mother yeah. and not being able to kiss her. Yeah. You know? I didn't ever have to use charity. Never yeah. in my life. What's the answer? What what can be done better? Um, a little bit more funding from the government mm -hmm. would benefit from us. When my boys were younger and, and we had a mortgage, we had to watch our budget and I was careful about what I spent on food and I'd kind of forgotten what it was like. Thank you so much. What Uncle Dave is doing is essential to these families. People would struggle to feed themselves if they were just relying on their government welfare payment. And what's extraordinary to me is that what he does is not funded by an organisation. The issue of Australians having enough to eat or to be on the agenda at the big end of town, not just on the agenda for the people receiving welfare. 
In the inner city, Pierre also relies on charity to survive. So what are you waiting for now? Well, this is where we go to get the food once a week. So we'll line up and they'll hand out a bag of food to each person and a few bits and pieces. Do you come every week? Basically? Yeah, yeah. But Caleb's sympathy is being tested. First and foremost, the, the things people on welfare should be spending their money on are the essentials. Food, water, electricity, the bills. But Pierre is in the food queue because he wants to buy a packet of cigarettes. He, he said he's got about $30 and he, he wants to buy bird seed and a packet of cigarettes. I don't think that's the right decision to make. So what have you got here? Um, well, we've got our fruit and veggies. We've got a thing of milk. Apples, they're for the apples. fruits for the birds, yeah, I assume. Yeah, they're pretty much. Egg and bacon sandwich, which I often eat now. And then some time. sausages. Sausages and, and some, some hamburgers. hamburgers. Yeah. And so that'll feed you for a week, will it? Yeah, it would. Choosing not to take free food, Caleb's going to see if he can feed himself on a welfare budget. We're at um, quarter past three and I haven't eaten lunch yet. Um, but uh, I suppose I'll have to go to the supermarket and try and budget my way through it. While you're going there to spend your pittance, you can spend a bit of mine. And uh, if I can ask you to get me a packet of cigarettes and some seed for him. A packet of that, which I think is $10. Oh, I know it's $10. And a packet of Pow Mau 20 reds. I'll be perfectly honest, I'm happy to buy you the seed, yep. but I would feel uncomfortable buying you cigarettes. Oh, OK. No worries what you're worried about, my health. No, I'm not worried about. I'm not worried about you. No, I'm just worried about. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not worried about your health. But I, I guess I think. I think about the fact that's money that you know you could spend on food or something. Well, I've already like got. That. As I've already told you, I've got enough food to last me till Thursday. I, so that's not I, I would personally no, that's right. feel it's, uncomfortable. It, yeah, okay, because personally, you'd make the decision of staying with the food and buying the cigarettes. I get that. Yeah. Um, but as I said, I'd have enough food to sustain me, which is why I'm enabled to make that to fuck to hell with the expense. We'll see when we get back. No worries. All right, let's go down and get these fucking cigarettes. I'm hanging out for a cigarette. <laughs> hey, Caleb's a very nice young man. I think his heart seems to be in the right place. But it's about what the government gives to people to survive, to me. That's what it's about. So I really don't give a shit either way of what people feel about me. Yeah, and one of my first rules in life, actually, is it's none of, my, none of my business what other people think of me. Caleb Bond is getting a first-hand insight into life on welfare. Oh, the supermarket! Having refused to buy Pierre cigarettes, he's only shopping for himself and the birds. I got myself some sausages and some bread and some cheese and an onion. So um, that'll cover, I mean, the sausages would be enough to cover probably two meals or even three to pinch. Also bought Pierre's bird seed, which is uh, weighing down my bag by four kilograms. Caleb's decided to draw a line in the sand on purchasing cigarettes for Pierre. I think Pierre's decision to spend his last $30 for the week on a packet of cigarettes as opposed to food is a, is a case of priorities being out of whack. I am making judgments about how Pierre spends his money. I mean, ultimately, that money has come out of the pockets of me and other taxpayers. I, I don't think it's unfair for me to judge or question the way he spends his money. If, if you're on welfare, sometimes you don't get to enjoy simple pleasures every day. I got myself some bread, which will go with uh, some sausages, yeah. which were marked down all the 25 cents. But they'll, but they'll mark down. You get the creative, don't yeah. you? It forces you. And, and, you know, and I figured, you know, um, there's what, eight sausages in there? I mean, you could make that into three meals. Yeah. Can you imagine if you did that for a few months? You'd get really good at it. Bit of sausage and bread, which I must say can hit the spot. I think a welfare system should fundamentally make sure that everyone has the ability to live. Oh, hey, I've smoked the joint out of it, haven't I? There are people who are genuinely needy 
uh, and deserve the help of welfare, which is something that we as a civil society provide through our taxes. I don't eat like normal people. Like one meal a day, perhaps two sometimes, that's it. And that's because of your IBS. Yeah, I've got it. And anyone who abuses that system is fundamentally insulting people who actually do require welfare. Sorry? Do you ever eat in peace? Sorry, you will from now on. No, in the kitchen. See you later. It's Julie's second day living on the welfare system. Even without having to pay rent, she's low on food and petrol and only has a few dollars left from her $40 a day allowance. So I'm off to spend some time with Uncle Chris and uh, I believe that we're going to try and supplement that income a little bit. Today we'll be um, picking up bottles and cans. Yeah. Excellent. So, so you up for that? Oh, totally. Return and Earn is a government initiative. For every bottle or can recycled, you earn 10 cents. So 10 cents a bottle, um, like what, what's your haul on a week, weekly basis? Maybe $20, $30. 20 or $30 a week? Yeah. Hey, that's all right. Other people are making more. There's a couple here. Look at that, eh? Yeah, a lot of people don't like you going through bins. OK. Some days are good, some days are bad, but yeah. It's a fair bit of work just for a little bit of money, isn't it? Yeah. While looking for bottles, Uncle Chris and Julie come across 64-year-old pensioner Helen. After I pay all my bills and everything, I have about $400 to live on. Yeah, and that's, that's in a fortnight? That's for a fortnight, so yep. 200 a week. Yeah. To buy food. 200 a week. And that, yeah. And how do you manage? Well, what you do, you just budget. You've got to really budget hard. You just can't survive. I've got emphysemia. Yeah, OK. And it's stage four. Oh, wow. So, yes, I've got a lot of medication that I've got to buy. Yeah. Puffers. I just had a heart attack a couple weeks ago, oh, so hell that's enough, more medication. Sorry. Yeah. Um, because the thing has damaged my heart. So I get a loan of Centrelink at Christmas time. Because I've got, I've got 18 grandkids and my great grandmother of four. So at Christmas you get a loan yeah, so that you can buy them a, so I can buy them a little present yeah. and then you pay that off over yeah, the year? Yeah, pay that off. Yeah, back wow. to yes. Okay. Yeah. And that leaves you under $30 a day yeah. for medication, yeah. food, emergencies, yeah. public transport. Yep. Everything. Yeah. Wow, Helen. So you don't get much, but you do, you don't survive. But wow. I've got a roof over my head. Yeah. Um, because the same thing has damaged my heart. Yeah. I didn't think I took a lot for granted, but um, I, I realise that I do. I take a lot for granted. I won't anymore. It's Caleb's last day with Pierre before he continues his welfare experience on his own. <laughs> I've camped before, so it ain't any worse than that. You uh, taking the toilet, are you? Oh, no, I'll be out in a sec. All right. Morning, anyway. Sorry? Good morning. Oh, morning, mate. Sorry. A lot of people they probably don't understand what it's like to live in a, a joint like this, a housing commission joint like How this. How are we? Now, I've heard the stories, I've seen around the joint, I've, I've seen what it's like. Um, I could only speak from my experience, which is that uh, some public housing is awful. Um, and, and that's a fact. Pierre's morning routine involves taking care of his birds. See how quick and easy that is? All right, who's hungry? Birdie num num's time. Come on. It, w it would appear that um, my best efforts to stop the birds eating my bread has not worked. As Cleopatra. It's a bird. As Cleopatra. Has eaten my people. bread. I suppose from a basic perspective, Pierre's birds, I, I think, are probably his best friends or, or his, his closest companions. So he basically said they're like his children to him. Have you got newspaper? 
Um, yeah. And I suppose it's why he makes decisions like he did yesterday about getting free food because it allows him to fund his pets, which on one hand I would argue isn't the best use of money, but on the other hand I understand why he wants to have them and what they mean to him uh, and the, the struggle he might have if he didn't have them. It's opened my eyes to, to something I hadn't considered before. There is children, there is uh, dependence. I love them, they love me, that's a pretty good thing I reckon. And uh, there's a reason for me to be around, really. Caleb's time with Pierre has come to an end. But as a journalist, he still wants to know more about people living on the DSP. Pierre is on disability support pension because he can't work. So there's not necessarily the element of encouragement needed for someone like that to go and get a job. So would I be open to the possibility of people on disability support pension receiving more money, perhaps I would. All right, Pierre, thank All you right. very much. No worries, mate, take care. Maybe even an extra $50 to, to live a decent life. How safe do you feel wandering around at night? I don't. This pretty much is a crossroads for people like myself that have survived domestic violence and being in a living situation like this, it's actually traumatic. Reported incidents of domestic violence in this part of Wollongong are 20% above the national average. Yeah, this is like a regular occurrence, sadly. It's like, I think they were just here yesterday too. Yeah. Oh, here they come. Wow. Yeah. That's, oh, that's minimal. <laughs> that's, really? Yeah, that means that there's not that much happening. There must be a bit of DV in the next um, block. Roger on, you did one to one. You can hear it screaming. What's happened? This is the boyfriend. Or... Okay. Yeah, right. We actually yeah. all thought he was inside because the way she was screaming. And now he's here. Yeah. For oh. Like, it must make you feel, like, just edgy and nervous, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to go back inside or are you right? No, it's okay. Witnessing domestic violence right on her doorstep is a painful reminder for Shanine. Oh, here comes an ambulance. Oh it my feels gosh, like that's, that's not a good sign, thing. is it? It's quite sad, it is. Yeah. It's full on, it's full on. Yeah. People are just used to this stuff happening here and that's a, that's a really bad sign. Yeah. Is it? Police are called to domestic violence incidents way too often. But people that are living in this public housing don't feel as secure in their home as people do in other areas. <laughs> All right, well, I might head off to bed. Okay. Thank you for having me. That's OK, no worries. All right. And having it happen all the time would be really stressful. So here I am uh, in Wollongong, and the main thing that I'm feeling is absolute frustration. All of the exhausting stresses that Janine has to deal with in her life, in addition to all of the trauma that she has been through. She doesn't need that stress anymore. New South Wales Greens MP Jenny Leong has been living with Shanine to better understand life as a single woman on JobSeeker. I feel really tentative about where we're going next. But the time has come to move on and go it alone. I've had, you know, what I would call the luxury of having Shanine show me around, host me, you know, allow me to, to share her home, give me a comfy spare room to sleep in. Jenny's heading to nearby Port Kembla to see what kind of accommodation she could afford on a welfare budget. It's been making me think about what happens to all of those people who are completely isolated and just are given a place to live. Oh, cool. I left you a note at my last 20. No, you didn't need to do that. No, then. no. I mean, like, I've been here. I've been, like, using your bloody water. I've been using your, <laughs> all your stuff. Ah, it's fine. So, thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, be good. Be okay. good at it. Yeah, I will. I will, for sure. I mean, Janine and I basically spent, you know, the last two days, two nights together. And so it feels strange to sort of be by myself. The aim was to put me outside my comfort zone and, uh, you know, I think we're about to get outside my comfort zone. Like many on welfare, Jenny has no bond and no credit card, so her only option is a room in a boarding house. Nearly 20,000 Australians call boarding houses home. This place is costing me 30 bucks for the night for rent. With my 40 bucks a day, that means that I've got $10 to spend. There's a mattress. That seems good. I was pleased to see that there's at least those security bars there and a screen door and a door, because I know Shanine was saying that she locks her screen door and the other door, so, you know, that's a good thing. I assume the fridge is working. Yes, it feels cold. That is a good thing. But there's no toilet. It must be outside. Set up of some basic things. That small roach can go outside. Every time that I've moved into a new place, every time I've moved into a new home, you do it with people and you, you do it with a sense of having chosen and knowing. So it's not like someone just says, okay, this is, this is your address to go to. I have heard so many stories of people sleeping on mattresses in housing and then having bed bugs, it makes you feel it makes you feel worried. The reality that you're living on 10 bucks a day because you need a place to stay and this place costs 30 bucks a night, that is a pretty daunting prospect. This could be a lot of white wall staring. Over the past two days, conservative commentator Caleb Bond has had his hardline views on welfare tested. As I saw with Pierre, uh, getting to the end of the week or close to the end of the week and not having any money to spend on food or essentials like that um, seems pretty poor, to be honest. But he wants to know more about the DSP, so he's travelling to nearby Redfern to meet Vic, who also lives on the disability pension. Vic's flat is in one of three large social housing blocks. It's a weird feeling in this building. There's a strange smell. It seems halfway between effluent and a dead animal. Now, this is a strange environment for me. A fish out of water, I suppose. Vic is legally blind, and after rent is taken out, she lives on $49 a day. Vic. Hello. My name's Caleb. Nice to meet you. Come in. Thank Go you. That way. Thank you. It's a lovely place you've got in here. You've decorated well. Tell me about all your vases just, and I Buddhas like, and all I sorts like, of stuff. I just like I just like them. Well, yeah. How long have you had your tattoos? Oh, probably going back 20 years. This one I just started to get yesterday. Oh, OK, that's a new one. It's a koi. But I've got to go back in two weeks to get it all coloured so I could save it for my tattoo. Do you find you're able to save? Yeah, well, I, look, I'm an alcoholic, but I've been sober nine years. OK. I find that if you give up what addictions you have, no matter what they are, you know, stop using them as a crutch, do something with your life, you can have a pretty decent life. You know, I mean, I eat well. I don't miss out on very much at all. Yeah. You know. So, but you know, you get all people, especially, you know, the flats and everything saying, oh, poor me, poor me, and they're all junkies, most of them, mm. you know. And you know, the government should be giving me more money. Well, no, 
go to rehab, get clean, and you can have a half-decent life. But it's a trade-off, too, with all the violence that goes on in the flats. What sort of violence goes on in the flats? Well, I've been raped multiple times. Here? Yeah, home invasion, assaulted multiple times, and that's in Redfern. If Vic just had somewhere decent to live, her quality of life would just be so much better. It annoys the shit out of me. Average two murders a year, the last few years. Two murders a year? Average. In this building? Yes. I'll show you where the last guy was murdered. That one in there. He was murdered last, December before last. So, so who was living in there? Drug dealer. Yeah, I'll show you in the laundry room. How do you feel when you walk into your laundry? I start sweating and my heart beats faster. Every, every time you come in Every here. time I come into the laundry. Because someone gets you in here, you're gone. Mm. Do you think the pension is enough? For me, it is. If you want to shop smart and you haven't got any addictions, I think it's fine. You wouldn't give yourself any more money? I'd love to give myself... I'd love Morrison to give me more money, but... It, it's not feasible. I don't know where people think all this money comes from. I mean, every dollar has to be borrowed. And it has to be paid back. But no, oh no, the government can do it. They've got plenty. You're saying that the money you have in your pocket is enough to live on yep. and have some luxuries, yep. like all the stuff you, yep. you have in your house and you're getting a tattoo. But what if you had extra money in your pension that allowed you to get a decent private rental. I'd be out of here in a shot. Mm. You know, who wants to put up with all this violence? Threats and, you know. <coughs> Vic is one tough cookie. She's been through a lot of shit, but she's picked herself up and dusted herself off, and she's resolute. <laughs> well, Vic, it's uh, about time for me to leave. I'll go and piss off. <laughs> Come on. Come on. My first experience of someone on the disability support pension was that they didn't seem to be able to get through the week on the money they had. I saw Pierre's experience and thought, oh, well, poor him, we should give him more money. But having now seen that, that Vic is able to live reasonably comfortably on the money she has and by her own admission um, enjoys quite a few luxuries, I'm kind of doing a 180 from where I was yesterday. I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted at the moment, which is, you know, I, I think it's good. It's making me think about it. It's what I came here to do. The thing that sticks out for me, that is consistent for both of them, is the shit they have to put up with in Housing Commission. Could you survive on welfare? It's a question that's led Jenny Leong, Julie Goodwin and Caleb Bond on a journey. After couch surfing in Surrey Hills, Caleb's decided to find his own place to sleep. Fair enough. Welcome to my humble abode. Jenny is spending her first night alone in Port Kembla. It was three dollars or two ninety nine, so three dollars, and so now I've got a dollar, um, a dollar thirty five left. Julie continues to battle isolation in crisis accommodation. Actually, have found this experience of, of cooking a meal just for myself a little bit depressing. But Christian, when he was driving me around the other day, was saying that he knows people that don't know when they get up in the morning how they're going to put a meal on the table at night. They've met welfare recipients trying to get by on the job seeker allowance and the disability support pension. I've been very, very close to having a cigarette. The only thing that has stopped me is that we now know how bloody expensive they've become. But I'm fucked if I can work out how I'm going to cook sausages in a microwave. If you think this journey has turned me into a socialist, you're wrong. Possibly the world's saddest bowl of mashed potato. But I have more empathy now than I did before for people on welfare. I've seen it now. I've experienced it. And to a certain degree, I've lived it. 
The welfare system, it does not help people out of poverty. It doesn't. It just doesn't. 660. There you go. There you go. All together. All together. What we've got is not working. Welcome to the, the abode. For three days, Julie, Jenny and Caleb have been experiencing what life is like on JobSeeker and the disability support pension. If I don't stick to my budget and I get live with nothing for two weeks. If you give up what addictions you have, you can have a pretty decent life. In the next part of their journey, they'll need to support a family or live as a carer on welfare. So I've seen how inadequate, frankly, welfare payments have been for single people. I can't imagine that supporting a family on a welfare payment is going to be a whole lot easier. More than 300,000 Australian families rely on government assistance for at least half of their income. For a family of four relying solely on welfare, that's as low as $33 a day per person. That means they are living under the poverty line. In Sydney's Inner West, Caleb's going to see what it's like to support a family that relies on government assistance. I think a welfare system should fundamentally make sure that everyone has the ability to live. It, it's there as a safety net, and it should be there as a safety net. There are just over one million single parent families in Australia. A third live in poverty. But I think part of the problem is that there is a welfare cycle which encourages people to stay in that system. Uh, and so the, the, the pitfalls are sort of self-perpetuating. They, they just sort of go on and on. Mary Ann is a single mother of four. Mary Ann. Hi. Caleb. Hi, nice Caleb. To nice to meet you. Come in. Thank you. How are you? All right. How are you? Welcome to my house. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is my youngest, Nayla. Nayla, do you want to come say hello? Hi. She nice just to woke meet up. You, Nayla. Um, this is Sahara. Hi. Nice this to meet you. Caleb. So to better understand Mary Ann's daily yeah. struggle, yeah. Caleb will try to support her and the family for the next three days on their yeah. budget. What I'll get you to do today is do a shop and basically house clean. Yep, all right. So you're like my money. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> How good is that? Let me do your hair. Sit on the step. Quick, quick, quick. <sighs> Mary Ann receives a single parenting payment for her youngest child. She also receives a family tax benefit for her older children. It might vary from 600 to 700 a fortnight. I don't receive any child support for the kids at all. Yeah, I haven't since pretty much they were born, and that's OK. Mary Ann's welfare payments are worth $70 a day for her and the four kids, or $14 per person. To supplement her welfare payments, Mary Ann does part-time work. Uh. The combined work and welfare payments total $25 a day per person. That's still $9 less than the poverty line. Are you able to meet all of your expenses? Uh, barely, just scraping through. I'm, I, I get scared sitting down looking at finances, I do, because I'm just like, there's a lot more going out than coming in. And I don't know, by the grace of God, I've been able to still survive with my kids and pay rent and be housed and feed the kids. It just stresses me out. My first impression, when you're living on that kind of money, you're thinking about money all the time. Like, it's, it's a constant level of, of concern or thinking about what you can do with what you have in your pocket. To support and provide for a family, you need to feed them. So Caleb's first task is food shopping. This is three meals for five people over two days. OK. That's all I have. $114. Yep. OK. At 21 years old, shopping for a family of five is unfamiliar territory for Caleb. A bottle of Passata 
is two dollars twenty compared to you know three fifty for a pasta sauce. Caleb has less than four dollars per person for each meal. Three litres of milk is three dollars seventy five, a dollar twenty or thereabouts a litre. Over here, you buy two litres for two dollars fifty. Not saving a lot of money, but you're saving some money, and and every little bit counts. I've got a bag of carrots. Got to think about whether a four-year-old wants green beans or not. <sighs> Fuck it, let's get some green beans. I uh, am going home with fourteen dollars and ninety cents left over, which I don't think is a bad effort for essentially ten breakfasts, ten lunches, and ten dinners. So, putting together a, a reasonably affordable and healthy diet for, for 114 bucks um, wasn't too difficult. All the stuff for bolognese, obviously. I've got two loaves of bread, so you've got sandwiches. Yep, cool. A whole lot of ham and cheese. Big thing of wheat bix. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh... No, I really appreciate you doing the shop, um, but it, you know, looking at my family and the way that they eat, it won't necessarily feed my kids or satisfy. Maybe one, just one kid or two kids. Yeah. Unfortunately for Caleb, he's failed to make the money stretch far enough. When you don't have a lot of money, what, what is the pressure like to do that on a regular basis, on your own, with the money you've got? Uh, it's a massive amount of pressure. I am the sole breadwinner to bring in for my kids, to be able to provide throughout their whole life about what they need, and shopping is actually one of them big things that I get overwhelmed with sometimes. Well, it'd be hard not to be a little bit defeated about the food shop, wouldn't it? I wouldn't ordinarily shop for family of five, so um, I wasn't totally in that frame of mind, I guess. So I didn't do the best job I could have, unfortunately. In Australia, over 2.6 million people are carers, typically looking after a family member with health issues or a disability. For the next three days, author and TV personality Julie Goodwin will be experiencing life as a carer on welfare. Being a full-time carer would mean that there's not a lot of time for yourself. I think it would be emotionally a very demanding thing to be doing as well. Julie is travelling from her emergency accommodation in Campbelltown towards Liverpool. She'll be helping DB care for her husband, Ron. Hi. Morning. Hi, Julie. Hi, DB. Hi, come on in. We're just getting um, Ron ready into the, the shower, um, and I'm happy for you to help us, mm -hmm. like, whatever you feel comfortable with, yep. so you, you tell me. Yeah, no problem. OK. The couple survive on Ron's pension. Did you sleep well? And DB's carer payment of $425 a week. That's it, Ron. Good job, Ron. You helped me out. Ron needs around-the-clock care, and right. DB estimates she puts in over 120 hours a week. Go. She also pays another carer, Liz, for about 30 hours a week. Good morning. Did you have a good sleep? Which means, after paying Liz's wages, DB earns just under $3 an hour. I understand now. The national minimum wage is just over $20 an hour. Good job. Thank you. Give me five, Liz. Give me five, Ron. Ron. OK, take the chair back for me, Julie. Sorry, Ron, I'm new at this. <laughs> I no, think I'm no, stuck on the door. All right, so I'll show you. Thank so you. It's like three-point turn. Ah, oh, OK. OK. Um, we've got to get him over the shower hob. Ron spent 30 years as a factory production manager. We're going to have a shower now. Would you like that? OK. Ready? One, two, three. Up. Chair, chair. In 2014, he was diagnosed with dementia. He came down with um, FTD dementia. It eats away at the brain or, or covers those 
brain things that tell the person how to speak, um, their anxiety levels. It renders him immobile, incontinent and non-verbal. So go round, another three-point turn. Hello? Hello? That's it. How much is, is Ron aware of? Not much. He's still here. Yeah. Um, and he's still in there, and that, that's the way that we look at it. Yeah. So, you ready, Liz? Yeah. That's a tough gig, to be caring for someone who you've loved for decades and who you've raised children with. Before caring for Ron, one... DB worked as a craft teacher. A lot of carers have given up work. They've given up superannuation, they've given up career advancement, and now they're living off this small amount of money. Hmm. Being Ron's full-time carer means dealing with harsh realities. I had to clear out his wardrobe clothes that he couldn't wear. He was never going to another wedding or wearing a suit um, or any of those things. Tough day. Um, I had to because this is what's going to make me a better carer for him. <sighs> Pretty amazing. Thank you, but all carers are. She's given over her life as well to, to care for, for the man that she loves, you know. That's a massive sacrifice. In the Illawarra region south of Sydney, Jenny will be moving in with 37-year-old Simone and her three-year-old son. She wants to find out what it's like living as a small family on welfare in regional Australia. Knock, knock. Hi. Hello, how are you doing? All right, thanks. I'm Jenny. Hi. Are you Simone? Yeah, hi. Hey, Simone. Hi, Jenny, how are you doing? Come yeah, in. Yeah, really good. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me come to your place. No, you're all right. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'll we'll just introduce you to the baby. He's oh in playing at the moment. Oh. We were, he's three, we were painting, but he spilt the paint on himself, so. Okay, right, so that's gave stopped up. now. Oh, hello, Bye -bye. little one. How are you? What's his yeah. name? Blade. Blade. Yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. We'll come back for you this way. Yeah, sure. Simone receives family tax benefits from the government. She's also on a disability support pension because she has a degenerative disease which prevents her from working. I have Charcot Mary Tooth. Um, it's sort of under the same umbrella as MS, yeah. um, so over time my nervous system shuts down. Yeah. I struggle with jars, zips, buttons, um, brushing my hair, grooming myself. Yeah. Um, hands get cramped up, feet cramp up a lot. Um, some days I don't have use of my legs. Yeah. Um, because she can't work, Simone survives solely on welfare which adds up to $47 a day for her and her son. All right, so this is usually like sort of my finances. Yeah. This is your budget folder? Yes. Okay. In electricity, I have been paying like 150 a fortnight. Uh, rent is 320, mm -hmm. um, but water is also added to our rent as well. So it's usually about 335, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Simone is paying more than a third of her welfare income in rent and electricity. Even on the highest rate of government support, Simone still runs out of money days before her next payment. This week I've literally got 75 cent left and $17 left in my savings. If money is that tight, like, what happens if, what happens if Blade gets sick? You know, you just work around it. Yeah. Um, you just work around it. If it comes out of the, you know, uh, Bubba's got a change tin there that we've been collecting change every time we get a little bit of change. So, you know, sometimes it comes down to pulling out that change drawer and stripping it. Um, there's been many a time where I've had to take, you know, $40 in $2 coins just to get things we need. To have to not be able to provide them with food when they're hungry, to not get them the medication they need when they're sick, that is a whole nother level. Journalist and conservative commentator Caleb Bond has expressed strong opinions on welfare in the past. 
There are people who I think are fundamentally lazy, and for some reason, they want to bum off welfare. Good on them. The system obviously allows them to do it. I mean, people like that should be weeded out. Um, if we want to talk about people who need welfare, who need assistance, I mean, that's money that could be going to them. But seeing firsthand what single mum Mary Ann has to do daily has him thinking. You know, I, I suppose I'm, I'm interested to see how they do it. How much money do you have to get by? Uh, how much time do you have in a day to do all the stuff that needs to be done? Mary Ann's been on and off welfare for 13 years after living through traumatic events in her past. I'm actually on medication for my mental health. May I ask about your, your mental health situation? What do you deal with? Um, Post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety. I was homeless okay. for a period of time. Yeah. Um, due to a not very positive relationship I was in and I had facts removed my kids when they were two and one. Why was that? Domestic violence. Right. And I ended up having to try and fight for my kids in and out of court while I was in a single woman's refuge. I'm still having to get professional help and still try and be normal and still try and be the mum and present for my kids. And that's bloody hard. Anything I can do for you, let me know. You've got enough shit to worry about, you know. <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah. All right, say bye. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, let's go. We've got to walk. Now, Caleb faces the reality of how much housework is required for a family of five. Sort of wondering, where do I start? There's a lot of washing. I suppose I better put a load of washing on there, or seven. Normal load, one scoop. Large load, one and a half scoop. I think we'll um, count this as a large load. I think money would make her life easier, but unfortunately, she's already been through a lot. You know, living in a situation of domestic violence and then losing your, your children, etc. No, it, it would, um, money would help with living in the now. The domestic violence abuse in Mary Ann's past has touched a personal nerve for Caleb. Domestic violence, um, well, if it doesn't make you angry, there's something wrong with you. If you loved someone, you, you wouldn't lay a hand on them. You shouldn't. You, you don't mean to. I just, I, I don't understand how one human being could mistreat someone they're supposed to love. I don't know. I, I guess this has been a little bit um, close to home. You know, I, I have a girlfriend who um, has gone through a lot herself. She had a very difficult childhood, having alcoholic, drug-using parents whose concern for her was minimal, where she ended up in the, the foster system, where she was sexually abused, and that has lifelong ramifications. <laughs> Rosie deals with that stuff very well. I see that in Mary Ann. She's damned if she's gonna let that stop her. I suppose I see a lot of parallels there. <laughs> you really care about people, don't you? Of course I do. Of course I care about people. It's, it's a fallacy that, that being right-wing means you don't care about people. The, you know, the, the left like, sometimes like to think that they've got a monopoly on it, but they don't. At 
Kate's DB and Ron's house in Sydney's West. Morning, Ron. I've got a bit of egg for you first. Julie is experiencing firsthand life as a carer. OK, next one. OK, Ron, here it comes. There you go. For DB, the role of carer has become all-consuming, even with help from support worker Liz. Just me and Liz just went out for the first time in 13 months. Oh, that's too long without a break, right? Yeah, but that's normal for most carers. Yeah. That, that's normal. I'm happy to go without. Um, I don't remember the last time I bought something. That's hard. But with dementia, you grieve why they're still here. Because I know that I'm losing my husband and the government's not doing what it can and what it ought to do. Um, DB believes home care should always be properly supported by government as an alternative to nursing homes. Not everyone can home care. Um, not everyone wants to home care, but for those that, that can, um, we try to do it for as long as because we know that they have more connection, um, more people visit. Like, we do all our entertaining here. You can't do that in a um, nursing home. You're stuck with whatever program they give. It's not that personable. Even though DB and Ron have paid off their home, with DB effectively receiving about $3 an hour from the government as a carer, money is still very tight. So she has to find other ways to make ends meet. One of the lifesavers has actually been um, food bank. Food bank? Yes, yeah, so that's um, run by our local church. Yeah. Um, so we pay $8 a fortnight and for that we get quite a lot of food. So we get um, loads of fruit and vegetables. Um, we get some meat in that occasionally. For eight dollars a fortnight. For eight dollars a fortnight. It, wow. Yeah, it's it's quite a blessing. Without charitable input into your household, the disability pension, the carers' pension, the carers' allowance, are not enough for the two of you to live on. Never enough. It's it's not even close. I I think it's criminal that the welfare that they're on is not enough for them to eat with. That shouldn't be a consideration of the policy makers. Well, they'll be all right as long as there's a charity that can help them. And it's not enough for her to have any kind of self-care whatsoever. What that is, is a recipe for burnout. And that, for Ron, would be disaster. Well, what about lunch today? Do you have any plans? <laughs> um, no plans. How about I cook your lunch today? Oh, oh my gosh, like... <laughs> <laughs> Falling in love already again. Like. <laughs> Caleb's cleaned the house, done a food shop, and now he needs to prepare dinner for the family. You know, I've cleaned all day, I'm cooking now. And um, so, it's getting a little bit harder. Do you know you cry when you cut onions? To keep the family afloat, Marianne also has a part-time job. But Caleb's realising it's not as simple as just work more and take less welfare. If I'm earning over a certain amount with uh, the single parent, then that'll mean I'll, I'll eventually have to pay full price here, rental market. Right, OK. Whereas at the moment, I have that security of that the rental here, it's, it's affordable for me and my four kids. Essentially, if, if you were working more hours, you, you wouldn't necessarily be better off because you'd be paying more in rent. Yeah, if that makes sense. Do you need any help with anything? No, nah, I reckon we're good. As a self-described conservative, Caleb is starting to recognise the welfare trap that people like Mary Ann can fall into. If she decided to work a bit more or work longer hours or earn some more money, she would be at risk of losing her benefit. The opportunity for someone to make a few extra bucks, which would then be a few extra bucks 
that they might not be asking for in a welfare increase. They just don't really get the, the chance to do it. The system actively encourages them not to do it. But if someone wants to go and earn an extra, you know, 200 bucks a week or 300 bucks a week, that just lets them get through a bit easier, I mean, for heaven's sake. So what? Turn that down a little bit. Just let it simmer away for a while. Dinner is ready. Marianne's whole family is back for dinner, including 17-year-old daughter Anika and 15-year-old son Cabe, who have just got home from school. Oh, here comes a backhander. Yeah. I'm quite chuffed. That's right. Thank you, Jesus, for the food. Amen. <clears throat> oh. mm. Good? Mm. Thank you. It's a pleasure to eat with you and to cook for you. <laughs> Across Australia, almost 4% of the population are receiving a disability support pension. Half have been receiving the DSP for at least 10 years. South of Sydney, Jenny is staying with single mum Simone. She relies entirely on welfare, including a disability support pension. Simone's health has been deteriorating in recent years and she blames her living conditions. I shouldn't have been looking at a wheelchair for at least another 10 years. And within moving in here, it was two years before I got my first wheelchair. I can't prep food on the house anymore. What do you mean you can't prep food on the house anymore? Cockroaches, rodents. Can't even go and make a sandwich without something trying to run onto your plate. Um, so now, most of the time, we try and eat outside. Simone's landlord is the Department of Housing. Yeah, and so this is where Blade sleeps? Well, most of the time now, he sleeps in with me. Okay. Um, yeah. Like, after the daughter came in and, like, he sort of said that the mould is that bad up underneath his room, he said, please just get your baby out of that room. Yeah, right. So you can see the mould. Yeah. Growing through. Yeah. Um, and that's like, that'll come through on the whole window frame, uh, yeah. probably within about four days after it's been cleaned. Yeah, it's full on. Yeah. So you've cleaned the floors this morning, someone cleaned the kitchen four days ago. Uh, this is not like, this is not because no one cleans the house, right? No. And I mean, like, when we clean it, we're cleaning from top to bottom every week. A bit. It feels like the more time we spend in the house, the sicker we get. This is allegedly what government support looks like. I don't even know how you begin to accept that that is normal, that someone can say that they're living in a house like this. Why the fuck does Simone have to go through this? It's, it's, this is unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable and what does it mean for Simone? I don't know. I don't know. Greens MP Jenny Leong is staying with single mum Simone to see what life is like on welfare for a small family in regional Australia. Jenny is shaken by the living conditions at Simone's house. It is a choice to not properly maintain public housing. It's a choice to keep people in poverty and keep them in insecure housing. That is a devastating reality. Jenny decides to take things into her own hands. So I wanted to ask you, like, I know who your local member is mm -hmm. and I've got his mobile. Mm -hmm. Are you happy if I try and give him a call? Yeah, of course. Anything that we can do to, pro like, get this process up and running as fast as we can would be amazing. Yeah. Jenny's calling Labor MP Ryan Park, the member for Simone's area. I'm here with um, one of your constituents called Simone. I've got you on speakerphone. Hey, Simone. Hi, how are you going? 
Good, thanks. I'm just ringing you because I'm, I'm at Simone's house and I'm actually going to be staying with her tonight. There's heaps of cockroaches and there's rats and there's also an insane amount of mould, especially in her baby's room, and the smell is it's like... Terrible. I know the only way housing will do anything is if an MP actually escalates the situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll try and get out there uh, tomorrow and see Simone. Yeah, happy to help, happy to help. That was Ryan. Well, we might actually get something done. Yeah. Finally. I hope so. Mm. So do I. So do I. In Western Sydney, Julie is living as a carer with DB. She cares full time for her husband, Ron, who has advanced dementia. Looking sharp, Ron. DB has to rely on food boxes supplied by the church to have enough meals in the house. They cost only $8. Well, I'm heading off down to the shops to get some ingredients to cook. Um, it'll mainly be for Debbie. Uh, she often doesn't eat lunch. So, yeah, I think it just might be nice to be cooked for. <laughs> sit down and have something to eat. So I'll head on in and see, see what I can manage. Back at DB's house, Julie is in her element. What's your favourite thing to cook, Julie? My pork belly roast dinner. I love cooking that because I always get a lot of love for it. Yeah, <laughs> I bet you do. Normally cooking with what's supplied through charity, this lunch is an expensive luxury for DB. Can I, can I ask you a difficult question? Yeah. Um, this is consuming your life. And I know you love Ron very, very much. Yeah. You know what I'm going to ask, don't you? Yeah, go on. Will there be a sense of relief when he passes? Yes and no. I, I think because I'm a person of faith and I'm confident of where he's going, that's easy for me. Yeah. I think the hard part is not having them there anymore. People got to the point where Ron's at now, it's needing so much care that a lot of people would say, well, it's time to hand him over to a medical facility where, you know, there's mm. nurses around the clock and able-bodied people there all the time. Yeah. Nursing homes can only do so much, but my husband deserves to be at home, surrounded with his pets, surrounded with um, his neighbours, his family, with the things that he knows and owns. It's family and friends that make the difference. Yeah. Um, community makes the difference. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be a recurring theme uh, that I'm hearing is that without community pitching in, life would get damn near impossible. Yeah. So, you know, having someone like yourself cooking a meal, um, you know, that will make a difference. Julie. Thank you. You Cheers. too. Cheers. What I'm seeing in there is extraordinary grace <laughs> and a lot of love and a lot of commitment. Tomorrow's going to be the same as today was, the same amount of work, the same struggle, the same, you know, financial stress, the same emotional distress, just day after day. I wish I knew, you know, how to fix it. <laughs> It's day two of Caleb's stay with single mum of four, Mary Ann. This morning, he's helping out with school lunches. What do you reckon? Two or three pieces of ham, how much do they want? Yeah, two is great. Two Perfect. is good. Wunderbar. And how do they like it cut? Uh, it triangle. Triangle. OK. Thank you so much. Say goodbye, Caleb. Bye, Caleb. See ya. <laughs> see ya. Well, I will see you both this evening. Yes, thank you. Mary Ann was up early for work. But 17-year-old Anika is slower to get moving. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. What uh, would you normally have for breakfast? So I normally don't. You choose not to or you just...? Ah, uh, I just don't have time. 
What gets in the way? Travel time and just waking up late. 2.8 million children in Australia are being supported by at least one adult receiving welfare. Young people who grow up in a household that relies on welfare are almost twice as likely to end up on government support. So how do you see your future? What do you want to do? Um, it's a dream to be a lawyer. and I've always wanted to pursue criminal justice somehow. I really don't see myself going to uni, mainly because my mum can't afford it. Does, does that make you feel um, upset, hopeless? It feels like it's just a dream crusher. Like I have really high standards for myself and I feel like I'm just wasting all that because I can't afford anything. If you didn't have those dreams and aspirations, how do you reckon you'd be? Probably fall into the same state that my mum's in. Just have a job, be a single parent, live in housing. It's not much to look forward to. And I guess you could say I've lowered myself a bit. So I've just put it down to find a good job or a decent job. Do you worry that you will be reliant on welfare? It's definitely a worry, but it's not what I'm aiming for. Aim high and yep. see where you get. Yeah. And what do you think that would be able to give you? Um, freedom. It'd be able to make me feel like I can make something of myself. Even if I didn't have that extra head start that normal families do, I know that I can work hard and get something if I want it. For me as a child growing up, I, I didn't necessarily suffer serious adversity. You know, I had two parents who got married, stayed together, bought a house, had me, had my brother. It was, it was just, you know, a working class childhood. See ya. The fact that Annika feels like being on welfare has held her back and affects her is, is unfair. Yeah, of course it is. But she still sees that glimmer of hope. And I, I just hope she never lets go of that. Like, you can't possibly prepare a meal for people with this, can you? In Wanoona, south of Sydney, Jenny and single mum Simone have decided to splash out and order in pizza. Here's your pizzas. Thank you very much, mate. No worries. Have a nice night. Yum. Oh my gosh, good, good. Nice. Well, bon appetit. Yeah, you too. Hey, mm. Simone, I've got to talk to you about two things. Ryan just texted me, mm -hmm. and he'd love to meet us here at 9.30 tomorrow oh, well. morning. Beautiful. So that he can come and meet you straight away so that we can make sure that this situation is sorted. And then the other thing that I wanted to chat to you about is... I don't feel comfortable staying tonight, mm -hmm. but I also don't feel comfortable leaving you here. Mm -hmm. I have a choice to go back to the place that I've been staying at in Port Kembla. Mm -hmm. I would like it. Mm -hmm. If you want to come with me, we can bring a fucking sleeping mm -hmm. bag and you can stay at my house. I, ca I can completely understand where you're coming from and the reason why I understand is because for a while, I used to spend quite a lot of time, especially over the first 12 months, out of the house because I knew it was making me crook. We need to fucking get you out of this situation yeah. and we need to make sure that Bubba is all right yeah. and we need to make sure that your animals can be with you yeah. and we need to make sure that you are not in a situation where you can't put a pizza down on the table in your own house, in your own backyard. Yeah, no, I completely understand that, you know, this is one hard place to stay. Like, I'm embarrassed to have you in my home and I'm not at all upset or thrown out at the fact that that's hard for you. I, I completely get that. I 
I know that there's probably people that will think that it was weak of me to not stay there, that I should have toughed it out. But that to me makes it like some bizarre endurance challenge. Oh, watch the MP spend a night in the cockroach infested house. If I lose some fucking political capital, because some people say, oh, Jenny Leon couldn't tough it, she couldn't fucking stay in a cockroach infested house. Well, they're missing the fucking point because there should be no fucking cockroach infested house in the first place. I can't help but think how problematic it is that the further I go along this journey, the more traumatic and devastating things become. And today I cracked. Today I cracked and I just, I couldn't cope with it. In the Illawarra region, south of Sydney, Greens MP Jenny Leong is preparing to head back to see single mum Simone. Jenny decided not to sleep at Simone's house because of the cockroaches, rats and mould. It's not the first time I've been shocked and outraged and disgusted by the way that people are living. Jenny is seeing firsthand that welfare is more than just about money. The problems with housing are at the core of the poverty, are at the core of the disadvantage. The broken housing system is the issue. Everything else flows from that. This morning, hoping to spark some immediate action, Jenny's arranged for local Labor MP Ryan Park to see Simone's place. Hey, Simone, this hey, is Simone. Ryan. Hey, hey, this is Ryan Park. This is Ryan, Simone. Ryan. I know, Sunday morning with two politicians. <laughs> no, I'll add it to my bucket list. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> as long as we get a photo so no. I can prove that it happened. No, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I know Ryan, we, we work together. He would know and trust if I called him that I wouldn't do it just for a random pothole. And so, yeah, it was a risk, but uh, a risk that I think was definitely worth it. Come on up, Ryan. You right, darling? Yeah. Every week we're having to wash the window frames down with bleaches and some pretty harsh chemicals just to get it off and within a couple of days it just grows back. So I don't know what to say about it. For many years, like I was forced to believe that I was this problem and Department of Housing made me feel like that I was the cause of all of this. You're not, you're doing it's your best. You. It's you're doing your best in a very, very difficult situation. So I was here with Simone at 11 o'clock last night and this is nothing compared to what it was like at 11 o'clock last night. It takes Blind Freddy can see you've got an infestation here yeah. and you, even through your efforts, you're not going to be able to keep it at bay. Yeah. You're asking for cockroaches to be eliminated yeah. from your property yeah. and for the mould to be fixed. I don't, I don't think you're asking very much at all and I don't want you to think you are asking for much because yeah. you're not. Yeah. I am under no illusions that Simone is a one-off case and when we fix that, the system will be fixed. I'm very sad that I've met you this way, but I'm also happy that um, Jenny bothered to give me a call so that I can yeah. try and get this situation fixed for you and your family and so that you feel a little bit of faith yeah. um, is still in the system. This is a huge, huge problem in this country and the only way we solve that is to stop people living in poverty, increasing the level of social support they're getting, and by making sure that the housing that they're provided with is actually a safe and secure and comfortable place to call home. Yeah. Thank you so much today for the no, because no. I know how busy you must be. No, no, no. I job. really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me in your place. One last attempt to look half uh, presentable when one goes out. In Sydney, with Anika and Cabe home to babysit, Mary Ann and Caleb are getting ready for a night out. Get to have some adult time. It's, it's a rarity for Mary, so I look forward to it for sure. Call me if you need anything. Okay. All right. Bye. A night out, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Juggling work, a budget, and a household means Mary Ann doesn't often get time out on the town. 
the biggest thing that would help get her off welfare um, is improving her mental health. And, and she's now working hard to do that, which is admirable. And, and she seems resolute that she will be able to do that. Nice. Well, I really don't mind the rain. It's a Friday night. I've had a couple of beers. And uh, apart from the fact my voice is atrocious, I think it's good fun. Like a rhinestone cowboy. Yeehaw! Thank you very much to my expensive audience. All right. My whole reality of being sole parent, the one release that I find is to sing. Once I start singing, it's like you just enjoy the moment. And the moment was being in that room with Caleb and just singing all the songs we wanted to sing. Mary Ann was a solid eight. She was, she was doing very well. Uh, I, I sort of let the team down a bit. <laughs> well, you're, you're a shitload better at this than I am. <laughs> that was now. just my warm up. Well, there you go, it was good fun. <laughs> on his last morning with Mary Ann, the reality of her future is playing on Caleb's mind. She's proven that it is possible to raise a family on welfare. She does it. But how sustainable is that? And she's got older kids, but she's got a four year old as well, which, you know, feasibly means. She's got another 15 years at least of a dependent at home. And if she doesn't have the opportunity to get out of where she is now, well, you know, it's essentially more of the same. Would you be disappointed if the cycle of welfare didn't end with you, that your kids ended up on welfare? Yeah, I would be disappointed. And my goal is, as their mother is, I want it to stop with me. Caleb is starting to wonder if living on welfare is more than just food on the table and a roof over your head. I'd like to think that Marianne and her family could get more support, because who wants to see kids struggle? And for someone like Marianne, it, it may not necessarily be cash in hand. It, it might be someone who can come in and assist in the house a few days a week. Sometimes I think it's more than money. And I think one of those things is just knowing that someone else cares or helps, I guess, which Mary Ann doesn't get. In Western Sydney, it's time for Julie to say goodbye to DB and Ron. Thank you for having me in your home, Ron. I really appreciate it. Really honoured to hear your story. I take my hat off to her for her resilience and her, her mental strength. See you later. There are decisions being made by people far away about what's an appropriate amount of welfare for DB to receive, and it's not enough. Even though they've got a house that's been paid off, they're barely making ends meet. So is this, is this all they have to look forward to? These people who worked hard, you know, beautiful members of the community, pay your taxes, be good citizens, raise your children to be good citizens. And it seems to me that all they've got to look forward to is just this spiral of, of living on welfare and debt and stress. I'll see you Thank later. you so much. After their time with families and carers on welfare, Jenny, Caleb and Julie are dismayed by what they've seen. It's not enough to live on. It's not enough to live on and it's not enough to be able to make sure that you're living in a way that means that you are not just constantly stressing about money. If I could change anything, the most fundamental thing I would do is make it a more human system. Come on. No, no, no. <laughs> it's lovely to meet you, Mary. You too. Caleb. And I suppose a one-size-fits-all system doesn't necessarily meet everyone's needs. Thank you, mary -Ann. See ya. See ya. Bye. I hadn't thought about that grief of watching the person that you've loved and you've been married to for 37 years suffering like that, and he is suffering. 
If the people could cast their focus broader because they didn't have financial stress at home or because they weren't worried every day about what's around the corner for them, what they could achieve, I can't even imagine. It's a great waste. It's a terrible waste. For the past six days, Caleb, Jenny and Julie have been seeing what it's like to survive on welfare. She's proven that it is possible to raise a family on welfare. She does it. But how sustainable is that? She's given over her life as well to care for, for the man that she loves, you know. That's a massive sacrifice. We need to fucking get you out of this situation and we need to make sure that Bubba is all right. But now it's time to try and get off welfare and into the workforce. Get off welfare and get into work. That is the best form of support any Australian government can provide to the Australian people. But first, you have to find a job. In southwest Sydney, Julie Goodwin is up and ready to head out looking for work. Women over the age of 50 fall into the hardest category for finding employment. Having a job is so much more than just putting food on the table. It's something to get out of bed for, something to look forward to, even something to complain about. And to not have that, that's not good. It's not good for anybody at all. In parts of Campbelltown, the unemployment rate is almost twice the national average. I haven't gone door knocking for a job since I was 14 years old, so I imagine that the that things have changed a little bit. My first job was a retail assistant in a Noni B store in Northgate, Hornsby. I just went from door to door asking for a job and um, I was 14 years and nine months, I think that was the the legal date back then that you could go and get a job. So using the same approach, Julie decides to hit the pavement. The idea of just running up and cold calling a business and asking for work is um, a little bit nerve wracking. Certainly not seeing very many uh, position vacant signs on the windows. There's obviously no point in me walking into a hairdresser and asking for a job. Um, there are nail salons. I also am unqualified to do that. Good afternoon. I'm very well, thank you. I was wondering if you would have any positions vacant if I was looking for work. Not at the moment. Not at the moment. Very, yeah, very family run at the moment. Okay, so it's family business. It. Are you family? Yeah, dad. Dad, son. And and another brother, yeah, another okay. Brother work, yeah. So I've got to bust into the family. That's it, that's it, somehow. Will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> Opposite us, the fruit shops are always looking for work. Oh, are they? Yeah. All right. Oh, you want a job? Yeah. Yeah, you walking for? Not in a fruit shop, but I... No, but I'm looking for someone in experience. With experience in this kind of... Shop and the Arabic stuff. In Arabic stuff as well, okay. Yeah. My philosophy um, when I'm employing people has always been that you hire for That's attitude and you train um, for the job. But some businesses, they're on the ground running, they need people to be experienced. And the only way to get experience is to get experience. Hello there, I am well, thank you. How are you? Thank you. I was wondering if you would have any jobs available in your shop. No? He okay, said, so that's another family business. And he said, I'm sorry, that's who I'm taking care of. If you're on welfare, get a job. It, it sounds so straightforward. There's nothing straightforward about this. When uh, one does not have a bathroom mirror, or a sink for that matter, one does one's teeth brushing in the kitchen sink. In Surrey Hills, Caleb's been living in a squalid one-bedroom flat. Rent is $40 a day, so he needs to find work to cover that and all his other expenses. I suppose what I have to now do is put myself in the shoes of someone who is 
on job seeker who is coming from very little um, and is trying to get out of the welfare system. For many Australians, moving off welfare and into work can mean having to work multiple low paying jobs. Caleb's starting out with food delivery riding. Delivery driving is hardly the most glamorous job in the world. It's generally migrants who do this kind of work. I, I think most um, working to, to middle class Australians would see food delivery or um, cleaning as below them. Most food delivery drivers and riders in Australia work as contractors. They have no minimum wage, no sick pay and no work cover. In a six week period at the end of 2020, five were killed while working on the streets of Sydney. To show Caleb the ropes, Muhammad will be his guide through the first few deliveries. Gentlemen. Uh, Caleb. Uh, how are you, Caleb? Nice Muhammad. to meet you, Muhammad. Yes. Muhammad has been working as a delivery rider for the past three years. What's it like? You have to be very patient all day on the roads. <laughs> patient with cars or...? Um... Everything, everything. What's the money like? It depends. It depends on uh, what time you are working and how many hours you are working. Uh, with Uber, it pays $4, uh, the, uh, which is the least. Delivery pays around 6 to 8 for that. Per delivery? Per delivery. 6 to $8. Dollars. If you were to work 20 hours a week, you would be able to earn around 150 to 200 I feel a bit trepidatious about doing the delivery, to be honest, at the moment. Show me how this stuff works. When you go online here, see? This kind of delivery is reasonably repetitious. You pick up food from one place and take it to another. Sorry, I you... Doing a job like this is reasonably dangerous, I would have thought. I've got enough money to eat, but I haven't got enough money to cover anything else. So, uh... Suck it up, Princess. With a bike and a phone, anyone can start working as a food delivery rider, with no training and no special licence. I guess this is not my typical line of work, so I'm under no illusions about the fact that I'm probably not going to enjoy it. Thank you. So I've got to go that way. That way. That way? Yeah. But, you know, work is work, money is money. I go hungry if I don't get money. Oh, well, that's a good start. Sorry, this is my first Sorry. time. Ah. <laughs> first trip done. Well, I suppose I'm a bit exhilarated now that I've had to dice it with um, the Sydney traffic on a bike. Um, so I'm sort of on the go a bit. Um, but but I'm, I'm otherwise OK. There's no fucking dry gullies on these roads, I'll tell you what. Fucking wet with traffic. Oh. For a delivery rider to get close to Australia's minimum wage of just over $20 an hour, they'll need to complete multiple jobs each hour. Hand it over or just leave it here? Uh, you can leave it there. No worries, thank you very much. That trip was worth $8.11 to me. So I am now sitting at $15.96 worth of earnings for um, about an hour's work. Look, my first impression, I feel pretty vulnerable on the road. I'm very stressed. Thank you very much. See ya. I am uh, on edge. I'm on edge. Four hours into his shift, and Caleb has made six deliveries. Just hit thirty dollars and thirty-three cents in earnings. Can't say wait. Oh, I'm here in one piece. Oh, man, my heart is uh, going. Oh, 
it's hard, it's hard work. Like, fuck. Icing in and out of traffic and fuck. Like, I'm cooked. Cooked. I'm mentally exhausted as well as physically. Adrenaline keeps you going, but it's pretty exhausting. In the Illawarra, south of Sydney, Jenny has been trying to live on the job seeker allowance for the past six days. A few dead cockroaches in the front room. Now she's going to try to get off welfare and into a paying job. But currently, she's having trouble just feeding herself. I've got one banana that is looking a bit worse for wear, but should be right in the fridge. But I actually have white bread and I have the leftover chocolate, so I've decided I'm going to um, eat bread and chocolate and banana for breakfast. And then I've got baked beans for dinner if I get no money. And pizza shapes for lunch. When living on welfare or a low income, even simple tasks like washing and drying clothes becomes difficult. Checked out the laundry last night and <laughs> it's not, it's just a laundry trough, there's no washing machine. So I rinse some stuff out in the kitchen sink. They're still not dry. Do I want to go to the laundromat and spend that money on washing my clothes? Alternatively, I could just wear some crusty clothes, be a bit stinky and deal with it. Nah, so it says a wash, dry and fold. Surely that's not right. Per load is 22 bucks. And then it says a half a load, which is what I have because I don't have lots of clothes with me. 15 bucks. Even the drying is 13 bucks, I think which is more than what I've got for each day when I've got money. I've got no money, so I'm going to walk down the street and see what it's like to actually go job hunting to see if I can get any casual work to get a bit of cash. Jenny's targeting the businesses on the main street of Port Kembla. I can use a coffee machine. I haven't done retail, but I reckon, um, yeah, if someone showed me how to use the machine, I would probably be all right if cash is this tight. I'm pretty much happy to do anything. JobSeeker is meant to help support people finding work, but getting by on the amount is a challenge in itself, let alone the stress of looking for a job. Jenny's about to learn firsthand how hard it is. We all know that when you're looking for work, it's not easy. You need to be able to get to and from interviews. You need to be able to have access to a computer or internet to be able to apply for jobs. You need to be able to have decent clothes so that you can actually rock up to a job interview if you get one. Now, a lot of people that are in these scenarios that are looking for work don't have any of those supports or any of those things. And by keeping those people in poverty while they're trying to look for work so that they are unable to attain any of those things or get that support, is hugely problematic. Hello. Hi, how are you going? Hey, how are you? Good, thanks, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, my name's Jenny. I actually am just wondering if you guys have got any casual work going at the moment. Uh, so you come from like hostility or? Uh, yeah, like a long time ago, but I certainly, I can use a coffee machine and make coffees. Yeah. And I've done like, worked in lots of restaurants and bars and stuff. Any food um, experience? Like no, I don't have food prep experience, okay. no. So, um, at this stage, are you looking for um, like food cooks? Chefs. All right, I nice appreciate you your help. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Day. See you later. See bye, you bye bye. Bye. I've certainly um, gone into places in the past when I first moved to Sydney and had to just go cold into cafes and shops to ask if they've got any work. So I've I've done that before, but I haven't done it in a very long time. And you forget how uncomfortable you feel and how demoralising you feel. Hello, good, how are you? Well, yeah, it feels uncomfortable to just get rejected. You want to say, oh, but what if I just did this or what if I just did that? But, you know, it takes a lot of courage yeah, to do that. You. Appreciate your help. Nice. Cheers. See ya. Bye-bye. After an unsuccessful morning, the last shop open is The Florist, owned and operated by Renee. And so, so we don't have the work and we don't have the money and there's not the government funding to be able to allow us to employ anybody. Yeah. We've got an apprentice and that's, yeah. it's, that's all we can afford to have at this yeah. point in time. Yeah. I'll leave you. I don't want to interrupt your business. You've that's got right. important this work to do. This is Pete. This is my apprentice. Oh, hello, Hi. Pete. How are you? Lovely to meet you. I'm Jenny. How are you doing? Pete worked his whole adult <laughs> life. But when COVID hit, 
he lost his job and was forced to retrain. A 55 year old male. Yeah. Um, I have three trades. Yeah. And I couldn't get a cash job now. I, I'm a chef by trade. Yeah. That is one of the best industries to yeah. have cash. So yeah, this is what I was trying to rely on because I can make coffee, but you no reckon that's like. at all. Australians over 50 will spend twice as long looking for work than younger Australians. I've heard people say that before, just get off your ass and get a job. And 20 years ago, that was the case. It was perfectly fine. You could go to Woolies, you could go to Coles, you get a job working night fill, not a problem in the world. You try and get that now, it's, it's, it's impossible. Those jobs, they're gone, or they're given to the young kids now. Because of our age bracket, we are so unemployable. Yeah. yeah. The government wants to give everyone else a, yeah. a, a hand up. I've got to prove yeah. that I'm valuable. Yeah, yeah. That sucks. Totally, yeah. totally. Having reinvented himself as a florist, Pete now considers himself one of the lucky ones. I feel amazing. I feel proud. But where, where we work, there's a, <clears throat> a man's hostel upstairs. And I see these blokes, I thought, shit, you don't want to be lonely and old and have addictions and everything like that. I think, how did I get lucky? It's, I feel humble. That's tough. That's tough. Because the whole model is set up that it's like you work and you get a job and then you earn your money and then you're not in poverty anymore. Well, that is not how it's working. That's broken. One quarter of Australians under the age of 30 need to work multiple jobs just to survive. After high school, Caleb moved straight into a cadetship and then a job as a journalist so he's never had to work multiple jobs. Growing up was, was pretty normal. Parents went to work, Dad was a gardener, Mum worked in retail. We, we never struggled, um, and that was you know, something I'm very grateful for, obviously. On his second day of working for low pay, reality is hitting home. Well, I mean, having done the, the Deliveroo stuff last night, it's pretty lowly paid. They're, they're not... Uh, meeting minimum wage, basically. $26.30 after paying my rent. I think my quality of life is better working. You know, once I paid for my rent, I had in my hand yesterday more than double what I had the day before. Before Caleb heads back out for the dinner shift on the bike, he's found a second job as a cleaner. I don't think it's unfair to expect people to, to make their own way or, or to, to at least put in some effort. You know, not, not everyone is going to succeed. It's, that is a fact of life. But the effort is the main thing, I think. His cleaning partner for the day and fellow contractor is Jorge. Do you want me to sit in the front or the back? Yeah, sit up here. 38-year-old Jorge is trying to get off JobSeeker after losing his job at the height of the pandemic. What did you um, do for work previously? So I was a car detailer for uh, Toyota. Yep. And so I got redundant, about five of us or so got redundant from there. Um, it was a shock. Yeah, this is uh, my mum's car. But after I got redundant and all that stuff, um, I had to sell it, pay rent. Jorge and Caleb only have two hours to clean a four-bedroom house from top to bottom. Can the dust all up there, take all that off. Yeah. All this bench stuff needs to be done. Toilet, I need to get right in the back there. Rubbish needs to be emptied here. Skirting boards along the stairs, mirrors, nice and clean. It's about 10, 15 minutes maximum on each room. Two hours isn't much. For completing the job, they'll receive $42 each. OK, let's get stuck into it. Glove up, let's go. Time is money. To be competitive and cost-effective, Caleb and Jorge need to work at breakneck speeds. <clears throat> you finished there yet? No. 
You've got to achieve a lot in, in two hours. Little spots. And it's a lot of pressure, because you're only getting paid for that two hours. There's no overtime. Okay. Well done? Yep. All right, guess you come in here. So all these need to come off, wash them up. Yep. All right in the corner, see in there. So not only are you going to be quick, but you've got to be, it's going to be done, done right as well. If you miss a couple of parts, you won't get the job back. Every job is important. I suppose the sustainability of this kind of work really depends on your fortitude. So when you need to finish up in here, we've spent too much time. A lot of people would struggle with it and a lot of people would probably weirdly thrive off it. I'll get you to start on this toilet. Yep. So get the brush, get it on the insides. But it would obviously Spray. grind you down if you, you were working for $21 an hour, day in, day out. In Port Kembla, Jenny has spent the morning door knocking businesses, looking for work. A piece of white bread and a couple of pieces of chocolate for breakfast. I've got some leftover sausages from last night, so maybe I could eat that. But yeah, it's not looking pretty good. After scouring the local area, Jenny's managed to get a trial shift at a caravan park as a kitchen hand with Chef John. Hello, how are you going? I'm Jenny. Oh, sorry, I'm Nick. No problems, Nick. I won't distract you. You're, uh, you're in the middle of a thing. Those people out there look hungry. <laughs> The average wage for a kitchen hand is $19.54 an hour. And this is the kitchen? This is the kitchen. John only works two shifts a week, earning him $375, which is not much more than he'd receive on JobSeeker. I'll prep if I've got time during the day. Yeah, yeah. But if I don't have time, I can't. Yeah. If I do what easy. I can do. Yeah. Not being able to secure enough work hours means many Australians feel like they're better off on welfare. You're responsible for doing all the ordering or someone else is doing that? Uh, somebody else does the ordering, yeah. I just let them know that what we needed. Do you want, are you worried about my hair or you're right? Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. There, there. Uh -huh, thank you. So two cups of self-raising flour from this yeah. bucket into this bowl. Yeah. Through the sieve. Yeah. About a quarter of one of sugar and that'll make the dry mix yeah, for our yeah. pancakes. That's good. Yeah. I'm just going to make a well in the centre. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think I was that hungry, and I didn't think I was that craving of some quality food, but now I'm standing in the kitchen, so I am feeling very hungry. Yep, now we just give a good whisk. Good. You know, there might be stresses about my current job, but there's certainly, certainly stresses about having to serve customers. A few big breakfasts. You've got a smashed avo as well. Are you on that? No, I'm on that. There's no more hash browns. That is a good bacon and egg roll. My biggest worry is getting through life week to week and knowing that I've done my best, but I've got to you know, always come up with that extra money. After falling on hard times, the park was more than just a workplace for John and his daughter, Isabel. Yeah, we ended up living here for eight months yeah. in a caravan. Um, we're paying $200 a week, yeah, which is very good. Yeah, yeah. She was going to school every day from here. She was, but you have to get up and you have to keep going. Yeah. You can't let that get you down. It's only temporary, and at the end of the day, it m might have been eight months. Yeah. But eight months in a caravan park to eight months in the streets. Yeah. No totally. comparison. John's combined work and welfare payments total $46 a day after rent. That's for him and his daughter to live on. For the family tax benefit A and B that I get, yeah. $300 a fortnight yeah. to raise a kid yeah. with food, clothing, all that kind of stuff, yeah. just isn't viable. Being a single parent on a limited income means simple things like school uniforms stretch the budget. So Isabel's uniform was 129 just for the one she had on today. Yeah. That's one uniform. She needs th at least three in total. Totally. And yeah, it's just, I don't have the money. She needs a laptop, can't afford that. So the school does, does supply and let them use theirs. But when she gets homework for home, 
can't do it. And so what does that mean in terms of her study? She's at a setback already before she's even started even high started. school. Yep. It makes me angry and annoyed, but what can I do, to be honest? Like, I've just got to look at it as, well, something that I've got to work towards. Yeah. So if I can pick up an extra hour at work or yeah. something, yeah. I'm in the situation. At the end of the day, I've got to get myself out of the situation yeah. as best I can. I give up everything, anything and everything I can for Isabel to give Isabel what she needs. Yeah, yeah. And it's hard, hard, but we can only do what we can do in life. Yeah. Australian children living in poverty are three times more likely to suffer adult poverty. I obviously care about how John's going, but I really, I really worry about Isabel. She is basically suffering discrimination because of the income status of her family. She wanted she want to be a, a vet. Amazing. But as I said to her, to be a vet, you've got to go to university. Totally. I don't want to be a vet anymore. I think she'd be better off with um, childcare. It would be easier for her in the long run. He's contributing, he wants to be working, but he's still not earning enough to be able to get by. He's saying that if there was something in the order of 50 bucks extra, that would make the difference for him to be able to save some money. There are over two million small businesses operating in Australia. But with one in three failing in their first year, being a business owner can leave you living on the breadline. Julie owns and runs a cooking school, so understands the stress of running a small business. I know that rush that you get when you've created a space that's beautiful and where people love to come. I know how uplifting it is. Into day two on the job hunt, she's decided to try and use her cooking skills and target cafes. Hello. Yeah, Hi, I'm, I'm Julie. Hoping to find a position vacant, wow. Julie comes across cafe owner Sonia. So this is your cafe? Yeah. Yeah? We don't own the building, but everything else, yeah. yeah. In 2019, Sonia won Campbelltown Business Person of the Year. I took over 1st of July 2016 so, from the yeah. original owner. She did a great job setting it up. But yeah, it's beautiful. We, yeah, we took it to a whole, whole other level. In 2020, the COVID pandemic hit and forced cafes and restaurants to close and only provide takeaway meals. I closed down two days before the government said that there was, that there, we were only allowed to do takeaway. Um, I, sorry. Don't, don't apologise, mate. Um, my break even point was $750 a day, yeah. which is massive. Yeah. And I locked the doors, like we closed early. I closed at about 11 o'clock on the Wednesday because I just, couldn't be in here with no people around. Everybody had already started working from home. Yep. Just gone and overnight, gone. yep. The, the walls were all done, like this was all decorated for yeah. me. And that's one of the, the loss of income isn't the only issue for Sonia. She also has an outstanding $100,000 business loan. So you can imagine the tables just oh. set up through here with the, and then out the front, we had the full use of the courtyard here. So. Oh. The idea of opening again is too much for Sonia. So she now works four jobs, which barely covers her business loan, rent and living costs. I work during the day for um, Pheasant's Nest Produce. So okay. I deliver fruit and veggies with them. Yep. Um, I work night times at Club Menangle. I'm a chef out there on the Saturday night. Okay. Um, I work at the beer shed whenever uh, they've got big events on. Is this seven day a week style stuff we're talking about? I work eight, eight days a week. Eight days yeah, a week. Yeah, 30 yeah. hours a day. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and how does that see you once you've, you know, made your debt payments? I'm not saving. I'm never yeah. going to be out of debt for, you know, the, lease, the loan on this place, the business has got 25 years to go on it, so. Ever any thought about um, filing for bankruptcy? Mm -hmm. Every day, yeah. Every day. That I wish I could just walk away, but the loan's secure against my dad's house as well, so oh. it, it doesn't, right. doesn't help. I can't 
walk away. I can I can go bankrupt, but it'll only be for the rent. Sonia put her heart and soul and uh, into this cafe, and it didn't pay off. This, literally, if I couldn't have drawn some money off my mortgage to take advantage of that JobKeeper scheme, this would be my story. I still have a fit out loan that I would have to somehow service if I had shut my doors. I believe you when you say <laughs> that this isn't it and that you're going to have another go at this somewhere down the track. Eventually. We'll be here. I can feel the, the dream that she had. I can feel the excitement that she had setting this place up. Her heartbreak is so palpable. In Sydney, Caleb is working multiple jobs to try to earn enough money to live. He's uncertain what he'll make later on with Deliveroo, so he's counting on the $42 from his cleaning shift. You asked me before, is this worth it? Not much of a choice, is there? It's worth it insofar as it means you've got money, but it's not like it's a, a stellar option, is it? No. Jorge has three children. After losing his job during COVID, he started working as a cleaner. This was the only job I could find. So now I've got no choice. How does that feel? Trying to be the man of the house. You're not much of a man anymore. Doesn't make you feel like a man. But it's not just about you know, feeling like a man. It's taking your wallet out to buy something for the kids. Dad, I want ice cream. Sorry. Makes you feel bad. Jorge and Caleb won't get paid any overtime, so they'll need to finish the job in two hours or they'll be working for free. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm pretty tired. Yeah? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm stressed, I think, more than anything Stressed? Else. Yeah. Feeling a bit hot? Yeah. Sweaty? Yeah. Well, well, not even halfway there. He does this on a daily basis. So, you know, if I were doing this all the time, I would be pretty fucking stressed. Having to work multiple jobs just to get by might not be as simple as Caleb first thought. Certainly not worth the money at the moment. And I don't think I could sustainably do it on a regular basis. I feel close to crying, but I'm trying my best. Hey, Gunda. Not as fast as I would like. Man, I don't know how you do this. Caleb and Jorge managed to finish the job in just over two hours. It's not easy, is it? <laughs> you think people think cleaning is just cleaning, but it's hard work. We're sweating our bums off here. How long do you reckon you can keep doing this for? Well, I'm not on the streets yet. <laughs> so if I can just manage to pay the bills, um, my rent, you know, chip in for the shopping and petrol on the cart so I can get to another job. Yeah. You know, anything less than this. If I didn't have this job cleaning houses, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. I, I wouldn't know. I couldn't tell you. You'd be in trouble. I'd be in big trouble. I would feel, um, I suppose, halfway useless if, if uh, cleaning was the only option I had for work. Alrighty. So that's yours. Oh, you kind of deserved it. Thank you. It's not much, but no. hey, it's something. It is what it is. Yeah. Experiencing for himself what Jorge has to do to get by, Caleb has plenty to think about. Happiness and acceptance are two different things. I can accept that Jorge is in the position he is in. It doesn't mean I'm happy about that. Would I like to change that? Of course I'd like to change that. But how do you feasibly change it? You know, it's, it's at some point you've got to think about practicalities. On a peripheral level, you can understand that, and hence why some people would prefer to take the welfare option. But fuck, what, what are you achieving by sitting around on welfare? 
Over three days on the job hunt, Julie's only managed to score two low-paying shifts. One letterboxing pamphlets, and another as hired help delivering furniture. It's just hard. This, this is a long day. She decides to call it a day and head back to her emergency accommodation. Uh, today's been quite sad. <laughs> There's definitely a lack of opportunities. What it's taking away from people is the opportunity to, to do more, to be more, to have a quality of life that many of us enjoy. It's her last night and Julie makes do with what food she has left over. This is dinner number three out of the barbecued chicken with some rice and I'm running very low on greens. The idea of one barbie chook lasting for three nights is foreign. Maybe some rice for breakfast. If you're factoring in rent, cars, tolls, clothing, all the things that you need in a household, there is absolutely no way, no way on earth that that money covers it. The struggle for the people she's met has made a lasting impact. I thought I, I had plenty of understanding, but I, I guess I just didn't. I, di I didn't. And I'm, I'm grateful to every person who let me into their lives, told me their stories, were really open. I think there's motivation to get off Job Seeker, even if you've got to work seven days a week to do it. I know that when I was cleaning houses, waitressing, taking in ironing, singing at weddings, clowning at kids' parties, I was working seven days a week and that was not my life goal. I just had to keep going until I reached a point and my family reached a point or I could back off that a little bit, you know. Yeah, no, nobody's sitting around going, woohoo, job seeker, I have made it. It's not happening. In Port Kembla, Jenny has been seeing firsthand the challenges of trying to live on low wages with few hours. Jenny is down to the last of the food she managed to put aside earlier in the week. If I was in this situation and I had no prospect of getting out of it, I'd be, I'd be really stressing at this point. The steel works in Port Kembla once employed 22,000 workers. That workforce is now just 4,500. It's left locals out of work and having to rely on charity to get by. You can apparently go here and get a meal. Um, so I thought that that would be a good thing to check out. Hello, hello. Hey, I'm Jenny. How are you going? Hey, Jenny. Nice to meet you. Hey. Emmanuel. Hi, Emmanuel. Lovely to meet you. Oh, Hi, George. Jenny. Yeah. Hey, George. Hi. Really Hi. good to meet you. How are you doing? Good, thank you. good. good. Um, I heard you guys give people food on a Friday night. Is that right? Every Friday, um, we usually open this facility for people to come and see it. Yeah. Have some social interaction. Great. Awesome. Free dinner. We have to cater and we have to guess how many people are going to show. Yeah. So, but usually we have enough food. We've never run out of food. Yeah. Jenny's decided to volunteer for a shift serving other patrons. Yeah, because if there's no something like this, people will struggle yeah. a bit more. Because yeah. whenever people come here, they save something for tomorrow. Yeah. You know, and it's, you know so. Yeah, I don't think what people get from the government is really enough. I, I come from a refugee background. Yeah. I came here as a refugee and I was on settling for a long time. Yes. And uh, yeah, you get $550 per fortnight. So you have to pay your rent, your bills and everything. Yeah. And yeah. Just like you're like, when am I gonna get out of this? Amazing. Bananas, peaches, pears, mangoes. Port Kimbla is a place where mostly broken people live. The current rate of unemployment benefit is, is too low. 
to have any sort of life. Um, my, I have one boy that's still at high school and it's fairly costly to keep him at high school. And, and, and the rents are so expensive, like my rental uh, takes nearly all of my money. Um, now, Brett, Rose? Uh... Probably say, I'll oh, go and get a job, but there's, the jobs just aren't down, down here this way uh, in the Illawarra. So you've really got no choice but to, you know, uh, have, have, have uh, unemployment benefit as your only source of income. Yeah, I'll have some nectarines here. Yeah, yeah. Have any. There's a couple of nectarines there. People that are work and think that there's jobs like it might be like the 70s or 80s where there's a lot of jobs, but that's not the case now. There's, you know, there's just not enough jobs. Having people in the community uh, coming here to help out and volunteer, and, and having other organisations getting on board by giving us what we need to be able to support the people is, is so fulfilling. We appreciate you coming Thank you. and seeing what we do. And we know that you've survived all day on a banana. Yeah. Today, so yeah. it's, our, it's our pleasure to give you a free meal. Amazing, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> These kind of, you know, community initiatives, it's actually the only option for people to eat, but also to interact. Now that I've had these experiences and met these people, I do get what's needed. And it's not some theoretical radical lefty concept, it's basics and food. As Jenny settles in for her final night, the reality of trying to get off welfare and into the workforce is all too apparent. It's been a big week. It's been a really tough week. Um, I wouldn't want to have to live on Centrelink payments. And I cannot wait to see my family and not sleep in a crusty, <laughs> crusty, stuffy unit in a sleeping bag. Jenny, Julie and Caleb's exploration into Australia's welfare system is nearing the end. The gig economy has provided some much needed income for Caleb, as he sees how challenging it can be to get off welfare and into a job where he earns enough to live. This morning I, I did my cleaning shift, for which I earned $42. So that's rent covered for the day, plus two bucks. So I've, I've treated myself to half a chook for five bucks, which I have demolished. Probably one of the best feeds I've had all week, to be honest. But the money he's earned is barely enough to survive. So he's hitting the streets one more time. The most uncomfortable thing about this position is that you don't really know what's on the horizon. Something might happen, I don't know. And if you don't have money there to pay for it, well then what do you do? But what, what sort of position are you in? I've got about um, 45 minutes or so until my next shift, which is uh, food delivery, like I did yesterday. My aim for tonight would be to make enough money to uh, get myself a counter meal and a pint. That, that'd, be, that'd be really nice. Caleb's logged on for the afternoon shift back in Newtown, in peak hour traffic. Not far at all. So um, we're on our way. I didn't feel so safe yesterday. And when you're dicing in and out of traffic, trying to get somewhere as quickly as you can to make your delivery, like it, it um, can be pretty daunting. You're constantly, is there a car there? Is there a car there? Is there a car there? Is that going to guy open his car door on me? Like, it's a constant barrage of things you, you're thinking about, as well as the destination you're going to and getting the food there safe. Stephanie? Good, yourself? That's the idea. Thank you. You too. We're off Bangkok Bites now. For three days, Caleb's worked to earn just enough money to live. He's made more money than he'd receive on JobSeeker. But he's realised it's not a great long-term option. Excellent. Thank you very much. See ya. This kind of job would probably help you get off welfare, but it's not the kind of job that is going to keep you off welfare. There you go. Have a good night. You too. See ya. Thank you. Enjoy. There you go, you've got some hungry mouths to feed by the looks of it. 
Thank you very much. So we're uh, now up to 48 bucks, which I must say I'm pretty pleased with. Seven o'clock, I've been out there for probably an hour and 45 minutes, and I've made nearly 50 bucks, so I am um, feeling pretty good about myself at the minute. So I think I might call it a day. To end his nine-day experience on the bread line, Caleb's treating himself to a meal and a drink at the local pub. I'll grab the um, fish and chips, thanks. It's making Caleb reflect on what he's learnt. It's not an answer to your joblessness. It's better than being on welfare, but it, I'd, I'd be wanting to get out of it pretty quickly. A little luxury every now and again just sort of gives you a bit of a lift. Um, a sense that there is still hope. For nine days, Caleb's belief that the best form of welfare is a job has been challenged. In very simple terms, the solution to welfare is to get a job. But the extension of that question is how easy is it to get a job? And for some people it's very easy to get a job because they have a skill set that will allow them to find a job easily. And for other people, they're competing in a crowded market. And it's not so easy for those people to get a job. And so I suppose to, to say to them, well, just get a job is unfair. A lot of people, I'm sure, are trying very hard to get a job and just aren't turning one up. And so I can understand why they would, would turn to something like this. Because it's income. It's some income. It's, it's better than having nothing. But it's, but it's, you know, it's not as simple as just get a job. I enjoy a good pub feed. But I never thought I'd enjoy a pub feed this much. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> it's been a bit of a culture shock, I think. Could you survive on the bread line? It's a question that's led Jenny Leong, Julie Goodwin and Caleb Bond on a journey. I would imagine for, for lots of people, seeing this will be a shock because they assume that if you get government support, that's going to support you. But when you're trying to survive on the bread line, you feel like you're excluded. You feel like you're separate from everyone and you don't belong. And I just done $300 shop yesterday. Yeah. And we're broke. This experience has certainly broadened my mind. That range between have and have not is outrageous. They feel like they've failed, you know, and I was like, you haven't failed, you haven't got a job. Yeah. And it was out of their control. Feels like the more time we spend in the house, the sicker we get. I don't know how many politicians have met how many people living in public housing. Like, the state is a fucking bad landlord. The system is broken. It doesn't work properly. You're not much of a man anymore. Doesn't make you feel like a man. I would like to think that we would have a nation where people who wanted to have a go at, at climbing up that ladder could give it a bloody good shot. Good morning, Ron. I've got a bit of egg for you right first. on the bottom bit. So giving people a little bit more money doesn't mean they're going to be laughing harder at the establishment. That's not what it means. What it means is that you're giving them an opportunity to get out from under that financial stress, to maybe have an outfit that they can wear to job interviews, to maybe look at doing that tertiary qualification. Come on. Go on. If, if there was one thing I could do to improve the lot of the people I have met through this journey, it would be to give them somewhere decent to live. It's not a massive ask. It's really not a massive ask. 